So interestingly, here's an implication. This is a bit of a digression here. If Hegel's correct in this, this means that the whole question of whether consciousness is reducible to the brain or whether you know, we have something like a Cartesian dualism where there's spirit and then you know, the corporeal organ, that's kind of a non-starter actually within the Hegelian framework. Because of course you have an organ. But that organ itself can be understood in two ways, in an objective way, which treats it essentially as a dead thing, even if it treats it as a supposedly living system. And then the other way, which is to say it is, it is infused with or it is integrated with spirit. And not just in like, you know, high performing individuals, everybody. So he goes on. Now, I mean, consider that too, another digression. Hegel has no problem with a sort of evolutionary perspective on the development of, of human being and all that. At a certain point, we get a creature whose brain function is able to be a sufficient vehicle for spirit, for geist, for something that we could never guess would have come on the scene. And we, we get to know, sort of, uh, according to Hegel, after the fact, after it's gone through its process of development. The actuality and existence of a person, of an individual, is that skull that you can feel, that you can look for bumps under the hair, maybe shave the head so you can see the bumps a little bit better. A little bit of a digression here. I remember when I went in the army, there's, there's a time that, that happens where, you know, you're, you're all recruits and people come in with all sorts of hair and then everybody goes to the barber and it all gets shaved off. And suddenly people look, you know, very strange, not just because they don't have hair, but you look at some people and you're like, wow, that guy's got a funny head. And other people you look at and you're like, that guy doesn't look too bad bald. Some people you look at and they've got big scars and all sorts of things. You're like, wow, what happened to you? Well, that's, that's because that's the externality. That is being existence for another. I can look at your head once it's shaved and say, that's a big knot you got there on your head. How'd you get that? Because you exist for another that way. That's how we exist in the world a world full of others, and we're reducing, as, as doing the phrenology uh, path, we're reducing a person down to their skull, down to what is exhibitable, we might say. So he says, um, this is how the relationship and the two sides of this relation are understood by the consciousness observing them. This is how observation, observing consciousness, goes in the wrong direction in the pseudoscience of phrenology. Now notice that for a lot of philosophers, the purer and more abstract it is, the better it is. Not for Hegel. Hegel thinks if we want to, and here Hegel, let me, let me preface this, this is sort of an aside, here Hegel is placing himself within a long, loose tradition of philosophers who think that you don't do philosophy well by getting away from reality that you have to take in. You don't just you know, come up with a bunch of ideas and then press them onto reality and say, so much the worse for reality. You've got to take your cues from reality. Who would that include? Aristotle, for one, right? Uh, in the Middle Ages, Thomas Aquinas would be another great example. In the early modern period, who might you look to? I would say Blaise Pascal is, is a great example of that sort of thing. And finally, you know, in the, the you know, 19th century, we have, we have Hegel on the scene saying, you've got to take account of everything. And that's actually where the Hegelian system shows its weaknesses. It's not in um, you know, what it does well. It's where it has, has 
has sometimes failed to go as far as it could in grasping concrete individuality. That's Kierkegaard's complaint, in grasping what's going on in material economic processes. That's Marx's complaint, you know, in um, making sense out of what's really happening in terms of the, the individual and um, enlightenment and, and religion. That's Maurice Blondel's point. We can go on and on and on. But all of those are working off of a Hegel who went about as far as that you can go with this, in part because he rejected pure empty abstraction. He said, that's just a starting point. That's not where philosophy ought to remain. Pleasure is something that we could see as happiness precisely because we do enjoy it, right? And if we don't enjoy it directly, at least somebody else talks to us about it and says, oh my gosh, you have to experience this. This is so amazing, so wonderful. I'm willing to pay $1,000 for this experience. And we're like, wow, that person thinks it's pretty good. Maybe there's really something to that. And you know, if you think about it, this is a bit of an aside, so many magazines, so many websites are based solely around this premise of somebody else experiencing something and then giving us some guidelines about that. I mean, even some of the ones about the life of the mind are along those lines. Oh, you haven't read Oscar Wilde? Um, well, you, you don't know what you've cut yourself off from. Oh, you haven't read Proust's? You know, uh, monumental opus, which uh, I'll admit I haven't read. Uh, I, I started reading it and got really, you know, tired of it fairly quickly, and decided I didn't need to spend any more time on it. Um, all these realms and ranges of pleasure offer us the possibility of enjoyment. What is